I love a great wine with a meal, but I like to cook with wine even more. Hi, my name is Mary Millard. Welcome to the Lecom Healthy Living Kitchen. Today we'll be visiting one of Northwestern Pennsylvania's many wineries, Six Mile Wine Cellars, where we'll choose a wine to use in our meal. First, we'll start with a beautiful seared skirt steak and spinach salad with red wine. Then I'll make a wonderfully delicious Concord grape focaccia. It's healthy cooking done tastefully. Let's get cooking. Hi, today we are here at Six Mile Cellar in beautiful Harbor Creek, Pennsylvania, and we have our two winery owners. We have Bart Toll and we have Patrick Walsh joining us today. And I just wanted to uh, bring these gentlemen on the show today to talk a little bit about one of our local wineries. And this is actually the first winery in Harbor Creek, Pennsylvania, yes? Yes, it is. Okay, um, tell me a little bit about um, when you guys got started. You are a new, you're a new winery. I think mm -hmm. you opened up in 2012, is uh, that right? We actually opened up in 2012. Okay. Yep. And uh, we started a number of years ago actually making wine for Patrick's wedding on a very small scale. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of five gallon batches of Niagara and Concord and uh, that progressed as the years went by to something that got bigger and bigger to the point of where we decided to actually open up the winery that you're in today. And tell me about the Niagara grape. I have to say I'm sure. not that familiar with yeah. the Niagara. Niagara's a, an, it's a neat grape because it's, uh, it works good. Of course, you probably have a lot of uh, Welch's uh, connotations coming to mind with it, and that's because uh, they make a lot of juices and jellies out of it. Okay. Uh, but also for our area, it's, it's a really good staple for wine as well. It's a, a sweet wine. A lot of people have really good feelings about the smell of it because okay. uh, the Niagara and the Concord grape are primarily what you smell when you drive through yes. Harbor Creek and Northeast in the fall that a lot of people associate. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, so fall sweet. Here. Okay, so your first season of uh, making wine, tell me a little bit about that. Like, what was your production like? What were some of the challenges that you had? Well, we started with uh, 900 gallons of wine that was comprised of 12 different batches from different grapes throughout the region. And halfway through the year, we discovered that there was a larger demand in Erie County that uh, we anticipated. So we were looking with, uh, working with other wineries to acquire some bonded wine and blended ourselves into our own styles. This year, we've tripled our production and we'll be around 2,300 gallons when we come out. So My that's, goodness. that's a, a threefold gain in only a year's experience. Patrick, tell me about bonded wines. I haven't heard that term before. Uh, Erie County actually produces probably the most wine in Pennsylvania as a whole, okay. and they don't always sell all of that wine throughout New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio. So some of it's available to commercial wineries to buy themselves. Okay. We of course want to make our own, but like I said, the demand was bigger than we anticipated, so we bought some of their wines and blended them with some of our own wines and uh, finished them into our bottles. Beautiful. How about any challenges, Bart, in this first year? Uh, probably the biggest challenge is <clears throat> wine, you can't exactly uh, just replace it immediately. Okay. Um, you can't produce it very quickly. Right. Um, you can't produce wine until you have the license. Uh, dry wines take a little bit longer to produce than what the sweet ones do. So uh, one of our bigger challenges in the beginning of the year is we had uh, a lack of dry wine because it was still aging. Uh, it wasn't ready for the bottle yet. So our first red, uh, dry red wine really didn't hit the bottle until uh, mid, actually kind of towards the latter end of summer. Is there uh, anything you can do to speed up that process, like moving forward? Um, temperature has a lot to do with okay. it, but really a lot of it, um, you know, you, you can uh, try as hard as you will, but uh, the wine's ready when the wine's ready, you know? It's we always say there's there's an art and a science to winemaking, yes. and we really try and let Mother Nature and the farmers do a bulk of the work for us because we don't have the time to add all the science to it, and we don't have all the money for the equipment. so. We really like to let the wine just develop on its own, not push it any faster than we have to. Exactly, and that so, makes that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. So I have to ask you guys, what makes the soil around this area so wonderful for growing grapes? Um, you know, because we are, you know, a pretty large producer of grapes in the United States, this area along the Great Lakes. Yes? That's, that's a really good question. It's also kind of tough to answer. Okay. Um, okay. A lot of the grapes in this area are grown for, well, just for the fruit, fruit juices mm -hmm. and things like that. So the soil, the terroir, as the French say, may not have been their first thought. What really makes our region unique is this microclimate that's buffered by I-90, which is at a higher le elevation, yes. and then of course Lake Erie, which is a huge mass of water yes. that helps keep the temperature uh, a little cooler and avoid frost in okay. the spring, and then it extends our growing season that lets the grapes uh, continue on almost to November when finally the lake starts to turn cold and freeze, and then we get this lovely winter that we enjoy. 
Have you ever thought about doing ice wine? Maybe that's moving ahead a little <laughs> fast, but yeah. you know, here in these parts, I know some. some we definitely thought about yeah, it. Um, yeah, right just, now, we really didn't have the, uh, the equipment to do so. And, and the grapes currently. freeze on the vine, yeah, and, I, and, that, and you produce the wine? A true ice wine, um, really, the conditions <clears throat> have to be pretty perfect for okay. it. There's a lot of years where you cannot you get a true ice wine. Okay, okay. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of neat. Yeah. That's really hard work, and it takes uh, a special winter. It's got to freeze really fast. And you have to have the the workers to go out in the field and pick those. Yes. And our vineyard isn't going to produce a, a very good ice wine, in our opinion, because it's more the fruit quality. Okay. Um, one thing we are working on that's going to be new and unique to the region is going to be a hard cider, okay. which is going to be carbonated. It's nice. going to be uh, available on tap, and then maybe down the road we'll have it in bottles. Beautiful. So it's more of that growler hour type of uh, a brewery offering. Great. I love it. I love it. Now, can we buy your wines? In any local venues, just out of curiosity, do you have to right. come out to the right now? Venue? We're um, just uh, for sale within this taste room okay. itself. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, the lower volume of wine that we produce, that's where it's been for sale. Uh, also, Patrick being from Pittsburgh, we've also entered a couple farmers markets down there as well. Beautiful. And I know I met you guys. I met these guys at um, a fundraiser this summer for the Erie Arboretum. Um, so uh, that was a, that was a real pleasure. That so was an awesome time. It was. Time. It was a great time. So all right. Well, thank you so much, you guys, and best yeah. of luck to you. Thank you. Thank sure. You. Now we're gonna make a delicious entree. Um, it is a seared skirt steak with a spinach salad and a red wine vinaigrette. We are using Six Mile Cellars. They have a really nice dry, it's called a winsome red. So what I did was I put two cups of the red wine in a small saucepan. I added two sprigs of uh, flat leaf parsley and two sprigs of thyme and I added some ch finely diced shallots and I let it reduce by half. So in here, if you can see, we have um, just a nice reduction of the red wine and the shallots and the, and the aromatics. I'm gonna go ahead and add some uh, cracked black pepper and I'm gonna add some salt in it as well. I'm going to go ahead and add about two tablespoons of red wine vinegar and by George, I'm gonna stir that. And before I go ahead and add the olive oil, I'm gonna take out the thyme before it gets stuck in my whisk here. Stay, stay, I'll set that down. I'm just taking out the thyme and the flat leaf parsley. The shallots are staying in. This is our vinaigrette. So if you open a bottle, you don't finish it which would be highly unusual in my house. But um, if you don't, or you've opened it and it's a couple days later and the wine isn't quite up to par, this is a perfect uh, idea to do with it. So we're gonna go ahead. Uh, we took out the, some of the aromatics. We are gonna whisk in, we've added the red wine vinegar. We're gonna go ahead and whisk in, I think it's about a half a cup of olive oil. You want this vinaigrette to be nice and warm on your spinach salad. There we go, so I've just whisked in the olive oil. I'm gonna set that aside. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna put a nice skillet on the heat. We're gonna put it on medium heat. And I have some really beautiful skirt steaks right here. And um, so skirt steaks come from under the rib and they're just like sheets of, of thin beef and they make a really, not, they're delicious steaks. Uh, we don't see them a ton here in America, but if you can get them, they're really, really good. Um, they are a little fattier than a flank steak. If you wanna lean it up a little bit, then absolutely, then absolutely um, use a flank steak, which is also delicious. We're gonna sear these for about three minutes on each side. Uh, I'm getting my pan nice and hot right now. The vinaigrette is resting, just waiting for us to get back to it. This is a really simple midweek dinner. Um, so there are, I know of um, couples, people that I know that just can't get away from red meat. They love red meat. So this is a really nice, we're incorporating uh, delicious spinach, really good for you, some mushrooms, a vinaigrette, and uh, it's a really nice, healthy midweek dinner. 
it's a good dinner anytime. I'm gonna go ahead and add some canola oil. Canola, canola oil has a higher smoke point than say olive oil. You can see it's smoking already. Higher smoke point means it won't burn as fast. I'm gonna go ahead, put our seasoned skirt steaks in here. And like I said, about three minutes on each side. There you go. All right. While those are cooking, I am going to make the spinach salad. I've already sliced some mushrooms. You just want to make sure they're clean and you want to slice them clean. Keep your eye on the steaks there. I guess your fingers too. Go ahead, slice some mushrooms. Steak and mushrooms go really well together, of course. Spinach and mushrooms. Go ahead, put those uh, on top of your spinach. Okay, and in just a moment, we're gonna mix it with the vinaigrette once we turn these steaks. See how they're doing? Ooh, searing up really nice. And now, this is not a nonstick pan. I would probably, if I was doing this at home, I'd probably use a nonstick pan. You could use vegetable spray or just a little bit of canola oil. That works really nice as well. All right, those are just about done. I'm gonna grab a couple more plates. There we go. Now, when these skirt steaks come off of the heat, you wanna let them rest three, four, five minutes. And what that does, it just brings the juices back into the meat. Um, I would cook this till it was rare to medium rare. That is my preference. If that is not your preference, that's okay. You can cook it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more well if you choose. So at this point, it's been about three minutes on each side. I'm gonna take them off. We're gonna let them rest. They look really good and they smell even better. Well, I'm just thinking now, we could have seasoned these with a little bit of fresh thyme as well. That would have been nice. Okay, we're gonna let them rest and then we're gonna slice them, mix up the salad, it'll be really good. So the skirt steaks have been resting. They look really great. I'm taking the vinaigrette and I'm just heating it up on the stove a little bit more. Just does not have to be boiling hot. Just wanted to heat it up again. That looks good, ready to roll. I do want to, um, just taste it a little bit. Make sure it's seasoned. It's really good. Okay, so I'm gonna take a large non-slotted spoon. Has a little bit of the sweetness from the, um, from the wine in that vinaigrette, really nice. Gonna take a large spoon and dress the salad. It's gonna kind of wilt the greens here. All right, a little salt and pepper. And we're gonna toss that up real nice. Mix up the greens. I can see them starting to wilt a little bit. They look really nice. Okay, I'm gonna get my serving bowl or plate. Put the greens in. I have to say, I always kind of liked using my clean hands to put the greens in a, in a salad, on a salad plate for some reason. I guess I was just taught that way, but using my tongs here, and I'm gonna take one of these skirt steaks, and I am just gonna slice it against the grain. Beautiful. really good. Okay, and I've let this rest about five minutes. So this is nice, medium rare. I'm gonna go ahead and put that over the top. Beautiful. That would make many, many people happy, I think. I'm gonna go ahead and just drizzle a little bit more vinaigrette on the top, right over the meat. And there you have 
a uh, seared skirt steak with spinach salad and a red wine vinaigrette using our local red wine. Beautiful. Hope you enjoy. In the world of food preparation, we typically turn to the tried and true recipes and ingredients that have carried us through our lives. They may not always have the healthiest ingredients in them. If you are looking to make some healthy living choices in your diet, think about ways you can substitute ingredients you currently use. Right here, I have beautiful sweet potatoes and yams instead of regular Idaho potatoes. Try switching bread, pasta, and white rice to whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, and brown rice. Substitute lean ground turkey for the ground beef you use in the taco, chili, or burger recipes your family loves. I love a plate of pasta, but when I'm trying to cut back during the week, I use steamed spaghetti squash and top it with a tomato basil sauce with added sauteed mushrooms and eggplant. Topped with a spoonful of fresh Parmesan, it's delicious. Living in France for a year spoiled me, and I need to have something sweet at the end of my dinner meal. Try some low-fat or non-fat Greek yogurt with a spoonful of vanilla extract and natural sweetener. Add some fresh fruit and or layer it with some crunchy whole grain cereal to make a parfait. Just by switching from full fat to low fat, refined grains to whole grains, and higher fat cuts of meat to lower fat cuts can begin to transform the healthy living lifestyle in you. So right now we're gonna make a Concord grape and rosemary and pine nut focaccia. Uh, really simple recipe. We're gonna go ahead and make the dough. We're gonna to top the focaccia dough with the different toppings, the Concord grapes. We have some other red grapes. We have some rosemary, a little bit of sugar. We're gonna start with making the dough. So I put about three quarter cup of warm water in a bowl and I topped it with two teaspoons of yeast. It's been about five minutes. You can see the yeast is alive and living because uh, it's starting to bubble up a little bit if you can see that. I'm just gonna gently mix that. Yeast is a living uh, thing so you wanna be gentle. You wanna treat it gently when you're working with it. You wanna use warm water. Um, you do not want to have uh, really, really hot water. It will kill the yeast. Um, I think it's about 115 degrees You can is the perfect temperature, somewhere around there, uh, to get the yeast activated and working. We're going to go ahead and add some flour. I'm going to say it's about, um, let me see, one, of the, one and a third cups flour. We have some cornmeal to add into this mixture as well. We have about five tablespoons of sugar, so it's a little bit of a sweet dough. And we have about a teaspoon, maybe a little bit more than a teaspoon of salt. We're gonna add that in as well. One thing that I did off camera was I had some olive oil and some chopped rosemary, and um, I heated them up on top of the stove and then I cooled it so it is cool to the touch. I'm gonna go ahead and add that to the dough. If you do have a stand-up mixer, go ahead and use a stand-up mixer. This isn't a large quantity of flour. Um, so I just, I have to say, I love working with dough um, by hand. So I'm just gonna go ahead and mix the dough by hand. It's nice and moist. This is gonna make one, I guess, loaf or flat of focaccia bread. And so it's a little wet in my opinion. It's a little moist, but that's okay. I'm not too worried about that. I'm gonna take some flour. I have some all-purpose flour over here. I'm gonna put my counter top, uh, cover it uh, liberally with the flour. And the more you work with yeast doughs, the more you'll be comfortable with, you know, is the dough too wet? Is it too dry? Um, this is a little bit wet, so I'm not really too worried about incorporating some more of the um, flour into it. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna take off the dough from my spatula here, set that aside, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it a nice sprinkle on top of the even a little bit more. And again, 
flower is different. Uh, some, uh, you're, sometimes when you're working with different flowers, you need a little add to add a little bit more. Um, it just depends. So right now, oh, that's nice. So I'm just incorporating some of this flower until it's not really sticking to my hands. There, nice. Still sticking a little bit. So I'm going to keep adding it and starting to knead it just a little bit. So this is, it has the nice um, gritty, it's gonna have a kind of a little bit of a gritty, I don't wanna say gritty, but more of a crunchy texture because of the cornmeal. It's got some nice flavor in there because of the rosemary. And see how I'm just kind of taking the dough with the heel of my hand and pushing it back, giving it a quarter turn, doing the same thing. I'm gonna add a little bit more flour and that is really nice, satiny, smooth. A little bit more. Use a little scraper to lift it off the counter. So now there are pre-made pizza doughs. You can buy whole wheat pizza dough. Um, you can buy just white pizza dough. Those are available. If you're in a hurry, you could absolutely use those. Um, those really come in handy. Some of our local stores do have the whole wheat pizza doughs. They are fabulous. And um, pizza dough is similar to a focaccia dough. So, uh, but you wouldn't have that nice crunch of the cornmeal or of the rosemary. So that looks really beautiful. Um, very soft, satiny. Um, it's a little bit heavier because of the cornmeal. The perfect thing to do would be to take a bowl, uh, just put a little bit of oil in there. You could use olive oil since you're using it in the recipe already. And I'm just using the bowl that we mix the dough in. And then just go ahead and put the dough in there, kind of coat it nicely. I'm gonna cover it with film wrap and set it in a warm place for about an hour and a half. It's gonna get soft, the yeast is gonna to start to work, it's gonna to start to rise, and then we're gonna pat it out and top it with our Concord grapes and our rosemary and pine nuts, get it in the oven. So after about an hour, the dough has rested, it has risen, the yeast has started to work. We're gonna go ahead and roll this dough out, get the focaccia ready to go in the oven. Just gonna give it a little bit a little more sprinkle of flour. You can use your hands to do this if you would like. I do have a rolling pin that I am just gonna go ahead and make it a little bit easier, get it started anyway. So this will not fill up the pan for sure, but, whoops, got away from me there. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and Kind of roll it out till it's maybe a third of an inch thick. And pick it up, fold it in half. I want to get it on that sheet pan over here. I'm going to go ahead, lift it up. And sometimes you can use your fingers like the real, that's a pizza pie. Oh, don't put a hole in it, Mary. Okay, I did, but it's okay. <laughs> All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and press that in there. All right, and then you're gonna use your fingers and just put some indentations in the focaccia, and that's gonna hold some of the olive oil, hold the toppings. We have some delicious Concord grapes. Concords, Concords are a local grape here in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And I'm telling you, the true flavor of grape comes from the Concord grape. They are really delicious. They do have seeds in them. So we seeded these grapes. We have some table grapes as well. The Concord grapes do not look that beautiful right now, but, uh, but once they're on the focaccia, it's baked. Some of the uh, moisture uh, evaporates in the oven. It's a really nice flavor all together with these Concord grapes and maybe some of the red table grapes. But all in all, it's about two and a half cups of grapes. I'm gonna go ahead and now I put parchment paper on my baking sheet and you can use olive oil if you want. You could put a little bit of cornmeal down on your baking sheet as well. 
Okay, so there's the Concord grapes. I'm gonna go ahead and put a couple table grapes on as well. And I do love red seedless grapes, don't get me wrong. Um, but really, just, uh, you really should try Concord grapes. I found this recipe, um, you know, growing up here in Northwestern Pennsylvania, and I just didn't really know, you know, where else Concord grapes grew. Landed in San Francisco about a year ago, picked up the newspaper, and there was uh, this recipe in the local San Francisco newspaper. I was heading up to Sonoma uh, for a long weekend, you know, so I was thinking of every other kind of grape but Concord, so that was, that was really kind of special. So we're gonna go ahead and put some pine nuts on this as well. Load it up with pine nuts. We're gonna put some more rosemary. We have rosemary as well um, in the dough, if you remember. Go ahead, and it looks pretty, and this is just something different. And what a neat uh, way to use Concord grapes other than grape jelly. Don't get me wrong, I love a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but this is a really nice way to use it. So I'm gonna go ahead, put a little bit more rosemary on top, and a couple more tablespoons of sugar, maybe just like uh, one, brings out the sweetness in this. But this would be a delicious focaccia with uh, sliced up, we'll slice it up, but it'd be delicious, served as appetizers with cheese, um, etc. So we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna give this a nice little drizzle of olive oil. Beautiful, that is absolutely, that's like a, that's like a picture, it's beautiful. I'm gonna put it in a 400 degree oven, bake it till it's nice and crisp on the bottom, and we'll see you in a couple minutes. So the focaccia came out of the oven. It looks beautiful. We're gonna go, it's still warm. And you can slice it in strips. I pretty much slice it in squares. I'm gonna go ahead and cut through it. And again, focaccia makes a wonderful appetizer something different, a great way to use Concord grapes. I think I'll cut these a little bit smaller as well. There we go. Okay, I have to try. I'll tell you how it is. I love it. Really good. Mm. Enjoy. Check out our website at cookhealthytoday.com and we'll see you next time. Get your recipes today at cookhealthytoday.com.